Hey there, my friends. This is Bill McDonald, the writing doctor. Today's video is part two on my series, modeling the editing of passages and essays in ELA R and writing using cups. Before I get into cups, I just want to make sure that we understand that your students are going to learn in an environment that is more student friendly. And we sometimes have to adapt our teaching in such a way that it's like a prescription that helps different ranges of students. Band-aids for kids who just need little tweaks and surgery type prescriptions for kids who are on a different level. So cups basically represents six different things when you're looking at passages and essays that all grade levels, all the way down to pre-K and kinder, should be held accountable for. Before I show you my editing portion of my folder, let me take a moment to show you CUPS kinesthetically and visually. The C stands for capital, capital. And with capital letters, we have to underline capitals, proper nouns, and titles. A little T above my head. The U is for usage. Many kids who are learning usage need to be functioning at a paragraph level because you have to check subject verb agreement. So it's usage, basically who did what. If you think of Spider-Man, you're gonna use his web to connect the subject with a web to the verb, the predicate, the action. And then I saw on a video, in one of his movies, he has red shoes and so if every sentence is like a street we have his subject we have his predicate and we have his red shoes at the end of the street called stop sign is the subject singular is it plural is it simple s or is it compound is there more than one person place thing or idea doing one predicate is the predicate past tense. I have my hands behind you. I have two hands behind you, behind Miss Mazasov. That's a compound predicate. A compound predicate in present tense, I'm pointing down. Compound predicate in future tense. Simple predicate, I would just have one hand. One person, simple sentence, doing one thing. John likes movies. John is the subject likes it's in present tense so we could also talk about our hands this way is it past tense is it present tense or is it future tense and that's usage the first key of cups is penmanship write neatly and we all know that the new teaks are asking us to teach cursive what i call aquaman because when he swims, his fingers are touching so that he can swim faster, just like cursive letters. Or is it Iron Man, where no letters are touching? Two of the reasons to get zeros on star in writing are that your writing is indecipherable or illegible. And if we as teachers are accept accepting fair or poor penmanship, the kids will realize, oh, in this classroom, I don't have to give my best. And so that's critical that we begin to have a standard of excellence for penmanship so that starting next school year, not this coming one, when they ask your students to have 25% of the questions being answered in a short answer format, or an open-ended structure, they're probably gonna have to write words or phrases or 
possibly complete sentences. And so that's why the P, the penmanship is going to be important because in a passage, I might not be, not be writing an entire essay. This is the last year of writing coming up for fourth and seventh, but I'm still going to have to be working on penmanship because in passages of different subjects, they're going to be making their kids do some sort of short answer open-ended. The P is for punctuation. So I have a ball here. And if you order part one of the video, you'll get to see how we use it and everything. And I'll do a little bit of it today. This ball lights up. If I do it right, so you can see it flashing there. I'm going to be showing you an activity today called punctuation is pause a ball where you pause to bounce the ball in different places depending on what kind of punctuation mark that you're looking at. If you think of the acronym FAT, the first letter of FAT is F. I'm going to bounce the ball on the floor for periods, exclamations, and question marks. I'm going to toss it up in the air for up apostrophes, contractions, and opening and closing quotation marks because those are up there. So a period estimation question mark, those will be red because we're stopping the sentence. One yellow, one set of yellows will be the apostrophe, the contraction, and the opening and closing quotation marks that are up there, up in the air. Those will be yellow because we'll be slowing the sentence down. The T of that is table for commas in fourth grade and lower, for colons and semicolons in fifth grade and higher. We're going to be held accountable for understanding how to use semicolons and colons in the upper elementary and in all secondary. So we would bounce the ball on the table for a comma, a shorter bounce for shorter puns. Another activity that came with part one is thinking of a slinky for every word that you write, you can open the slinky one inch. And so whether I have a real slinky, like I'm doing here, these are six to eight for a dollar at the Dollar Tree, or a big one. As the kids are reading their own essay, they can open the slinky one inch for each word. And if they have 30 or 40 words, then you would have to open the slinky 30 or 40 inches. And that's a visual kinesthetic way to help them think about punctuation. If I suddenly see a comma in the middle of the sentence, let's say I'm at just about 10 inches there. So after the 10th word, there's a comma. You can teach your kids, bend the slinky low for a comma or bend it up high for an apostrophe, a contraction, or an opening and closing uh, quotation mark. So that in the binder that you get for attending any webinars this summer is called the saggy slinky because there are some kids you're gonna have to go buy those metal slinkies from walmart because they could write an entire essay they could write two or three pages with one period because their brain is not making them think of correct punctuation their essay is one big run-on where they keep running in place and never stopping for a period. So one activity that I have in the binder is called running with run-ons. So if your kid, let's say, has 80 or 90 words and then one period, then we make the class stand up and we all say, we're going to run 80 or 90 steps, one step for each word that's written without a punctuation. So we only have two letters left. The first S is spelling, which most of you are familiar with. So we've already added one letter to your cups, which most of you normally see. But the reason that many of you are struggling in terms of essay is because there's not a specific standard of penmanship that I mentioned in part one of the modeling, the editing of passages and essays in ELAR. And in this video, you're going to get to see in this part two, you'll get to see the other S. But in spelling, we have to see the word. We have to say the word. And so that's why uh, you saw on my Facebook yesterday, 
when you're looking at the word, you're trying to say, okay, how does this word look the same but sound differently? Or the opposite, how does this word look differently than other words, but they sound the same? And so kids can get very confused unless you make them think about what the word looks like and what it sounds like by recording pictures with your eyes and videos with your ears so that you can hear and listen. The last S is the one that most of us don't cover and I'll be showing you as part of our questions today. It, it talks about sentence boundary. In editing, there's two S's. That last S is the one that most students struggle with because we don't realize there's gonna be questions that will say, what is the correct way to write sentence blank? That's a run-on or a fragment. What is the best or correct way to write sentences blank and blank? What that usually means is that the one sentence is a complete thought and the other one is a fragment or that the first, the one of the first one is a complete thought uh, fragment and that the other one is a sentence. And so make sure you start teaching your kids cups with two P's and two S's. Let me share my folder with you. And this is gonna be part of the, the handouts that you'll get in the part one training. That's my advanced folder right there. And because we're only focusing on the editing portion, this upper right hand corner basically gives your kids the keyword strands when they're editing passages and essays with cups. So I'm gonna zoom in just a little bit more so you can see the three keywords. Whenever it says what change should be made in sentence blank, it's basic cups, capitalization, usage, punctuation or spelling. And as you can see in punctuation, there's my red stop signs and my yellow punctuation marks that slow the sentence down. We talk about usage with Spider-Man. Spelling, seeing the word, say, saying the word, hearing it and listening to it, thinking your brain, what spelling pattern is this? What rule is this? And if you can't get it in your brain, there's another word that starts with a B called a book. You can use a dictionary to look up definitions, to, to see um, something that's not in the context of the sentence or paragraph that you're looking at. And hopefully by the time they go through all that, they will write the right answer. The last S that I mentioned, check for complete subjects and predicates. It'll say rules number two and three, what is the correct or best way to write sentence blank? That's a raw. They'll underline correct or best and they'll label run on or fragment. The third one, what is the correct or best way to write sentences blank and blank? That means, like I said, it's either a sa or a fans. But the first one is a sentence and the second one is a fragment missing the subject or the predicate. Or if you flip it, the first sentence is the one that's the fragment missing subject or predicate. And the second one is a complete sentence. And so we have to make sure, because I noticed in the ELAR questions for fifth grade and higher, they give your kids questions with correct and best. And so they're gonna have to be able to, in ELAR, understand the difference between what change which is the question they'll ask 80 to 90% of the time, and what correct or best way should I write sentence or sentences, which will be asked anywhere between 10 to 20% of the time. So uh, that is real important. It's basically 75% uh, of the test in fourth grade writing this year, just this part, because when you include the essays, and because part of spelling is vocabulary, 
raising your kids vocabulary adding some words that are just there to help them learn vocabulary from different subjects from that week or voice your voice is who you are on the inside and the reason i would say include voice vocabulary in your spelling is in order to get a four one two three four gets a good score it says choose your words carefully on one of the rubrics on the prompt page and if your kids writing have no voice that means there's nothing going on in here they're not sharing their thoughts and their opinions what the scoring guy says their point of view and perspective about the topic and the idea that they share about the topic my voice and my heart is my feelings and emotions how could i tell you with higher vocabulary how i feel instead of using words like sad and happy and mad what synonyms could i use that are higher vocabulary of my voice or i could remove those words that are tell me emotion words and you could write a sentence that shows what you do what you say or think when you're feeling a certain emotion i remember this one little girl, she was talking about the frustrations of being a middle school student. And in the beginning of her essay, she talked about the car ride to the school each morning for her. And it was every morning, the car ride to the school is a blur. And the butterflies in my stomach transformed to writhing, agitated snakes. Basically, she's nervous. And she's overwhelmed, but she said, my teacher told, told me I have to show how I feel, not just tell. At the end, she expresses frustration with show, don't tell. She says, every evening when I get home, I just fling myself on my bed and sob my stress and anxiety into a much enduring pillow. So if uh, a middle school student can do that, we can teach all of our students to show their voice. And so that's why it's so important to work on part of our spelling being voice and vocabulary and even transition words. And all of that is inside the editing part one. And so for those of you who watched part one, we got Quite a quite a long ways in our session, but we were we were in the middle of looking at question three, sentence number five, and I noticed I had made a mistake when I shared something with you guys. So I want to go over question five before we finish this passage, and then I show you one run on and one fragment. So let's take a look at. The question regarding sentence five, it said, what change should be made in sentence five? So the R stands for read it, we did. The U stands for underline, we underlined change so that we could label L cups. That every time it says change, it's just capitalization, usage, punctuation, or spelling. And we'll also label with a little bracket or highlighting sentence five, change, and we're gonna put right here, make sure this is about question three, not uh, question five. Sentence five goes with question three. Question three goes with sentence five. And for those of you that remember, we noticed I made a mistake there. Change screamed to scream. I've already fixed that and so I will, when I email you this video this afternoon, I'll make sure that you get the updated copy where it'll say change screamed past tense, my hand behind me to screen present tense right now. What we thought was the case was that there were two correct answers. And when I looked more closely, I 
can't pick letter C because we would not do what it says here and ins insert quotation marks after the exclamation mark of sentence five. It's going to be change lowercase all to capital all. And so let me show you why that needs to be the case. There are sentence five. As you can see, we have an opening bracket and a closing bracket. Sentence five, capital. I screamed, past tense, in an angry voice, k, k, comma, k, k, quotation, k, k, capital. We need to have a capital at the beginning of dialogue. All that work was for nothing. K, k, closing. Got to close this street because we're done with our complete thought. And we thought, oh, we need quotation marks because we're done talking. No, we're only done with this sentence. Since the same person, I, is talking on the next sentence, who did this to my brand new pool? Question mark, quotation. You don't put your quotation marks until you're done speaking. If you're going to say something for two or more sentences. So it's sort of like pushing play record when the person starts talking and pushing the stop button when they finish talking. So hopefully that makes sense. We need to have a capital because it's the first word in a direct quotation. Okay? And if your kids are having to explain to you why they choose an answer, don't just eliminate the answer that you're not going to pick read that we're not going to pick. We labeled in the passage, underlined and read in the passage as well. So since we are going to select D, I suggest you tell your kids also use the E, explain not just why you eliminate, explain to me why you select an answer in the book and in the scantron. So the reason we're going to select D is it's the first word in, and we can abbreviate here, a direct quotation mark. Not Dairy Queen, but a, a, when someone is speaking. So that's number three. The only one that we did not do on that passage on Thursday was number two. And that one involves punctuation. That's why I drew a question mark. So we said that the R, U, and L are read, underline, and label the question as you read it. So we would read what change should be made in sentence three, underline or highlight change, label sentence three, calling it question two, and we would label cups saying whenever it says change, 100% of the time, the mistake can only be capitalization, usage, punctuation, or spelling. So when we go back to sentence three, we're going to check and see, should we change could to can? That's about usage. It depends on how it's being used. Change the period to a question mark. And you want to know something. So I'm going to show you a little drawing that I made with a question mark, which you're going to think of the question mark as someone's ear who's asking something that starts with one of these words. And if you think of the dot as the eyeball, if they look and see that a sentence starts with one of these words, green for go, then you'll say, okay. Someone is asking something, and I, they're going to be hearing and listening for someone to answer them. And so what you might do to help kids remember question starters is have them on a nice, strong tag board sheet of paper, draw a big red question mark where they remember that, oh, there's my ear. 
I'm going to be waiting for a response because somebody is asking something. And I look at all of the words as I'm reading different passages from different subjects. And what I recommend that you do, if your kids are doing their own rough draft, you can tell them after you finish with your rough draft, circle all your sentence starters in green Number one, so we can make sure that we're not starting sentences with the same word. And number two, so that we are not ignoring that these words are just a few examples of sentence starters. So I'm not going to write sentences with my pencil on all of those, but I'm going to give you examples with my mouth. Will you marry me? Won't you ever do what I ask you to do? Question mark. Do you, Bill, take Valerie to be your lawfully wedded wife? Question mark. Who is that man in the second row? Question mark. Which strategy is going to be best for each student? Question mark. Where would you like me to place your dinner? Question mark. Why does he keep saying that? Question mark. How can I make kids pay attention longer in class when every five minutes that passes, one student stops listening and is only hearing noise after a while? When should I take brain breaks? to make sure we bring those kids that we've lost back to focus. May I go to the restroom, question mark. <laughs> no comma, you've contraction already gone 12 times this morning, exclamation point. What is your first and last name, question mark. Were you going to finish the passage that we started on Thursday, comma, capital Mr period, capital McDonald, question mark? Yes, comma, we are doing it right now, period. Can you go over the run-on and fragment questions from the second passage as part of today's video, question mark? Yes, comma, I will do that, period. Did all of you who registered for Thursday's webinar get the digital recording of it sent by email and the PDF attachment that comes with it, as well as the certificate of attendance. All of those are just a few examples. And so what you might do is if your kids draw their own question mark and color it in, in red like I did, every single time that they're reading, they can have this little question starter guide off to the side somewhere, and they could add new words to their list as a little warning that a question is coming up, okay? The reason I said that is because we have a question coming up for sentence three, all right? Says, on letter H, change have to have. And if the one to the right is right, then you can circle it. If it's wrong, then you cross it off. And so what I've done in all three of these, I can't do these three because when I read it, listen to it as I read it softly in the sentence, substituting these words it didn't work and so i've eliminated three from this question i've already labeled underlined and read in the passage so we're going to select letter g place a little g next to it fill it in to practice bubbling so that's me pretending like I did the book and that I bubbled the scantron. Somebody asked me the other day, do you recommend bubbling 
as you go or at the end. And I would probably say at the end, so there could be a systematic, organized structure of kind of doing one thing at a time. So let's take a look at why we need a question mark on sentence three. It says, question two, labeled, bracketed, highlighted. I want you to notice when people ask me, Mr. McDonald, do you think in ELAR and editing or revising, should we re make the kid read the entire passage? No comma. You can tell that they're only asking questions about these highlighted sentences. And so for kids who struggle with reading, it doesn't make sense to make kids do on a passage level things that the questions are only asking about on a sentence level. So let's take a look at that one. Capital, how could this have happened, period? Because we said that how is one of those words that were question starters. We can say, ah, oh, our stop sign should be converted from a period to a question mark. And you can't really tell very well, but this is a red colored pencil. So that's finishing passage one for all of you guys. And what I did, I tried to match for you ELAR teachers, I tried to match the difficulty level of the third, fourth, and fifth grade ELAR passages. The ones that I saw, there were two or three of them about a story. And this story, because if you look at the purpose, just happens to be a personal narrative because a personal narrative is a story that someone wrote about themselves. So this is a story that Lisa wrote about herself. So personal, think of it like this. A person, me, A-L, actually lived out this or since Lisa is not a real person, they don't know that I'm making this up, so actually lied about it. I pretended to write a story about myself and my outdoor pool that I don't even have. I pretended to be some girl named Lisa just so that I could have a passage that looked like the ELAR passages that you see have no titles. They just have a topic about a struggle with an outdoor pool that Lisa had one day when she noticed the water had come out of it. So let's move on to the second passage. And it's got, as you can see, five change questions. And so I've already marked them, change the sentence number and cups capitalization, usage, punctuation, and spelling. And so I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you that on the next video. But the one that I was concerned about for many of you because run-ons and fragments do so poorly is question number six and seven. Now, just so you know, fourth grade teachers in ELAR, there were no questions that look like this on your test, on your sample ELAR passages, but for writing in fourth grade, they get at least one or two of these kinds of questions on the editing portion every single year. And they do poorly every single year. So make sure that those of you who have the binder, go ahead and go to my passage in the binder that has this whole passage practicing nothing but run-ons and fragments or sentences and fragments. So let's see how differently reading 
a question about runs and fragments and sentences and fragments from a regular sentence. Read underline label. What is the correct way to write sentence nine? As soon as we see correct, we're going to write rock with a question mark because sometimes with correct and best, it will still be cups, but we're going to write rock because we're going to check and see is what we look at in sentence nine a run on or a fragment first? And if it's not, then we'll label cups afterwards. We just have to check the content to see what is sentence nine about. So we'll look at sentence nine. Back in the passage. Notice I'm not even reading anything else. Question number six is about sentence number nine. Okay, watch me in the corner of the video for a second. And then we'll do it again so you can watch the, the, the sentence. Capital, it, apostrophe S, it is a bit of a challenge to control your speed and direction at the same time. My brain made me pause right there. So what it's telling you when you read S-O softly or L-O loudly, when you're doing it solo by yourself, hey, there's a warning. There's too many words here without a punctuation mark. The gas and brake pedal are right next to each other, period. So I would bounce my real or imaginary ball on the floor for a period. And, and I would say, capital, it, apostrophe S, a bit of a challenge to control your speed at the same time run on. The gas and brake pedal are right next to each other, period. And so, as you can tell, I drew a vertical wall where the period should have been. And in many cases, what the state does is they just put a period there in the answer choices and a capital on the next word. Sometimes they rearrange the sentence to keep the content, content intact. They just change the order. So let's look at our four answer choices for question number six. So we can see which one is correct. Now, you guys that are in, that came to the webinar, in today's email, I sent you this. So if you didn't attend the webinar on Thursday, but you do have the digital copy of the binder, you should find this fat guide on pages 543 and 544 of the binder, the new and the old versions. It's what do you do with the real or imaginary ball whenever you see a comma, a semicolon or a colon, you bounce the ball on the table, T. When you see an apostrophe, a contraction, or quotation marks, you toss it up in the air, A. Yellow for slowing down the sentence, red for stopping it. What do you do when you get to a stop sign? You stop. A stop sign for writing is called a period, an exclamation, or a question mark. And we would bounce our real or imaginary ball on the floor. And then if you flip it over, it has those same guides and it says correct or best. It's staff or fast, sentence and fragment or fragment and sentence, or the correct answer could be no change. When it says correct or best with single sentence, it's sometimes a raw, a run on or a fragment, or it could be no change. If we find out when we read it, it's not a run on or fragment, then we can go ahead and label cups. Number three, in most cases, the question is going to say this, what change should be made in sentence blank? We'll underline change and label cups, which is capitalization, usage, punctuation, or spelling, 
or as before, the correct answer could be no change, okay? So here's the key. When we're reading solo, this is gonna be page 594, for all of you, all of you who received Thursday's digital copy of the binder. See the sentence. Take a picture of every word. Number two, open your mouth and say the sentence softly or loudly. Not just the words, but all of the capitalization and all of the punctuation as well. Label, hear and listen. There's little question marks there. So you can listen for commas and periods when you have run-ins and fragments. That's a big help when it comes to working with these kinds of questions. Then they're gonna think in their brain, okay, what kind of a problem do I have in this? Is this a run-on? Is it a fragment? Is it a sap? Or is it a fast? And if they have some words they don't understand, number six, they should understand how to navigate the alphabet so they can, number seven, understand how to use a dictionary and look up definitions that they don't understand, even though the sentences are in context. Some kids don't understand what certain words mean. It's like a foreign language to them. So you'll say, use your dictionary for definitions or uh, parts of speech. What part of speech is that? Is there a past or present or future tense of that word? Or use a thesaurus to help you understand other words that mean the same thing. So the two books are a dictionary and a thesaurus. If all the way to step eight doesn't work, then how can you do this sentence or sentences kinesthetically, where I can get my body, my face, my hands involved? And what you get is number 10, you'll probably and hopefully write the right answer. So your lowest level in your classroom are the VVAC learners, what you, some of you call the total physical response. Are you making this lesson V visual for your kids who are visual learners? Are you making it verbal where they have to open their mouth softly or loudly speaking the question, capitalization and punctuation? Are you making it auditory for auditory learners where they actually have to be able to hear themselves you or others as the sentence or sentences is are being read okay or are you helping those kinesthetic learners if all you're doing is giving worksheets that's not real teaching a teacher says i'm going to do whatever band-aids or surgery are required to help my students have a complete understanding of what it is that I'm trying to get across to them. And I highly recommend that you do run-ons and fragments this way because too many kids are just not getting it. The average percent correct for these kinds of questions, number one and two, are anywhere between the 30s to the 50s or 60s in April. And that means that you've already taught them for eight or nine months and they still struggle because most of you have cups with one S stopping at spelling, not cups with two S's where the second S is discussing sentence boundary problems. That's not revising or sentence structure. It's just sentence boundary issues where we, you either have not enough punctuation or too much punctuation. So. That's as part of your attachment. Those of you who have um, received this as an email, let's check and do this kinesthetically, verbally, and auditorily. F, capital, it, it, it is, I tossed my ball up, and I separated it, I separated it from is. And that way your kids can do that verbally and kinesthetically. 
a bit of a challenge to control your speed and direction, period. I bounced my imaginary ball on the floor, F for floor. Capital, at the same time, comma, the gas and brake pedal are right next to each other, period. What they did wrong there, floor, what they did wrong there is they changed the content around too much where at the same time, which was supposed to be doing two things at the same time, we accidentally placed it with the gas and the brake pedal being next to each other, which changes the meaning and the content. So I wouldn't want to pick an answer that changes what the sentence is trying to say. Letter G, capital. It's, it is a bit of a challenge to control your speed and direction at the same time, period. Floor, capital, the gas and brake pedal, period. Capital are right next to each other, period. Now I wanna tell you, if your kids are being allowed by you to read silently, this is what their brain is going to see. The gas and brake pedal, the gas and brake pedal are right next to each other. They will run that stop sign and not even pay attention to the period because you're letting them get away with keeping their mouths closed. But the students that I work with are taught to make sure you do something or say something to remember that there's a stop sign there and we cannot pick an answer that has a fragment as one of its answer choices. Letter H, capital, because it's, it is a bit of a challenge to control your speed and direction at the same time, comma, bounce my ball on the table, the gas and brake pedal are right next to each other. No, that's the wrong cause and effect. So if you put the correct cause, the brake pedal being right next to each other has an effect of it being a challenge. So what the state does a lot of time is they switch the cause and effect around to see if your students are even paying attention enough to notice a difference. So listen to the correct cause and effect in order to pick this one. Because the gas and brake pedal are right next to each other, comma, dependent clause, followed by a comma and an independent clause, it's a bit of a challenge to control your speed and direction period. So that one, because it's the wrong cause and effect, we're going to eliminate letter H. So I've only got one left. I hope there's something correct about letter J. Capital. It's, it is a bit of a challenge to control your speed and direction at the same time. Semicolon. What that means is instead of using a comma and a fanboy like a lot of us do to join two ICs, independent clauses, IC2, you can also say substitute a semicolon, join two independent clauses by saying, come to get this right now by putting a semicolon but with no capital on the second portion, unless it's a proper noun. The gas and brake pedal are right next to each other. And be careful when your kids, if you make your kids write sentences, brake and pedal have two words that uh, sound just like them. Let's take a break and a flower has a petal. And so make sure that they don't accidentally so you might do a little, what I call a TMI, not too much information, but do a 
teachable moment of um, instruction to say, guys, notice those two homophones. There's two other words that sound like them, but look differently. And so if they sound like them and look differently, you might remind your kids, we are going to have to make sure all of you see that a little bit better there. There's my antennas, my ears. Or you have to look at it carefully to say, hmm, those words look differently, but they sound the same. And so do real quick teachable moments of instruction with your kids. So the correct answer is going to be J, an independent clause, capital, followed by a colon and an independent clause, little i this time, and a period. So that's how you would do a rough sentence. Let's close today's video by doing number seven and touching on an open-ended question that I've included uh, in both passages so that we can practice preparing our kids for open-ended short answer responses that will happen beginning in the school year 2021-2022. All right, number seven says, read, underline label, what is the best way to write sentences 11 and 12? So I underline the word best. That's rule number three because it's not just one sentence we're having to investigate. We're having to investigate two. And the reason I have two dots there is your kids have to remember, oh, they're asking actually about two sentences. So I'll make an opening bracket before sentence 11 and a closing bracket after sentence 12. And I'm going to label it question seven. And we're, gonna, we're also going to label, is this a SAF, a FAS, or is it just a regular cups? But that's the first thing you're going to do is check those hard uh, ones to see if it's one of those. Let's take a look at the sentences before we try to look at the answer choices. Sentence 11 and 12. All right. There they are. And as you can see, I've already read them and labeled them so that I can investigate, identify what the issue is with the sentences. 11. Capital. Even though there are not going to be real cars and trucks around you, period, even though is a little clue of a dependent clause that needs to be followed by a comma, not a period. Capital, you still have to be careful to avoid Trees, comma, let me do it this way. Trees, comma, obstacles, comma, and lakes, period. And many of you ask me, Mr. McDonald, are they ever going to test the comma? that's before the fanboys in a comma in a series question? And the answer is no, because some writing programs teach that the fanboys can be the substitute for the comma, and some teach that you need the comma and the word and. And so basically, if there's only two things, you could look at it like this. Two, two things being discussed in one sentence, obstacles and lakes. But because this one has three things, we have to say 
trees, comma, obstacles and lakes, period, or trees, comma, obstacles, comma, and lakes, period. So that's a visual way to help your kids understand commas in a series. So that we have this sentence here being a fragment. So I can't leave it that way. I've got to see which letter choice, because this is question seven being an odd number. We, when we look in just a second, odd numbers can only have A, B, C, D as their answer choices. And even numbers can only have F, G, H, J, or in the case of this one, it's gonna be an open-ended. So let's check out our answer choices. And again, this is me modeling, editing, and revise, editing of passages and we'll be modeling an open-ended question so you can see how you might teach your kids to answer it, okay? All right, here's A. I'm gonna read it, underline and label if we need to, eliminate or select it. Capital, even though there are not going to be real cars and trucks around you, semicolon, well, you can't substitute a period or a semicolon because we said that was a dependent clause which needs to be followed by a comma so i'm not even going to continue because our rules state that it has to be a dependent clause followed by a comma and then an independent clause so a is out b capital even though there are not going to be real cars comma, and trucks around you. And I just finished telling you that if there's only two things, cars and trucks, you don't put a comma when there's only two. And that's why some programs say, you know what, whenever there's only two, three or four, don't put the comma because when there's only two, some people are telling the kids, every time you see and, go ahead and put a, comma well not when there's only two so i'm going to eliminate that one because it breaks a comma rule some of our kids are what i call kamikazes or comma crazy they just want to go crazy by putting commas so i'm going to eliminate that because we were only talking about two things being around us not three that would have required at least one comma letter c is going to be our correct answer let's find out why Capital, even though there are not going to be real cars and trucks around you, comma, T for table, dependent clause followed by a comma, followed by a non-capitalized independent clause, you still have to be careful to avoid trees, comma, obstacles, comma, and lakes, period, bounce on the floor. So that one's done correctly. So I selected letter C. That means we have to figure out what's wrong with D. Capital, even though there are not going to be real cars and trucks around you, comma, so far so good, table bounce, you still have to be careful, period. Capital, you have to avoid trees, comma, obstacles, comma, and lakes, period. The reason that they often put best in an answer to, in a question is because sometimes there's two answers you could pick and there is one of them that is a distractor. They're trying to get your kids to pick this one, but if they pay attention, yes, you could have two sentences, but repetition have to, have to hurts the paper. And so I'm gonna eliminate because the best one is not one that has repetition. The best one is that doesn't. And so if you tell your kids, think of repetition as bricks, that the, the same bricks that you keep using in consecutive sentences that make the sentence sound like there's gaps. Because if you have a, a, 
wall and you take off two bricks on this level right here and you use those same bricks called have to on a, on a next level what you leave behind is a little hole and so whenever there's lots of repetition kids that would normally get threes and fours on their essays are going to get twos and threes depending on how much repetition if you're just repeating the same sentence over and over they're going to give you a one or possibly a zero because there won't be enough writing that's there to actually call development be called development all right let's do our last question and i just threw this one in like i did on the first passage so you guys can see what is it that the open-ended short answer questions might that they might look like in ELAR, math, reading, science, or studies. So it says there's one change that should be made in sentence 13. Well, it still says change. I've highlighted sentence 13. I could also put a bracket. I don't like underlining like some of you do because if there's a period or a comma inside sentence 13, sometimes the underlining causes your students to accidentally cover it up and they won't be seeing the period and comma. And if you're reading softly, you won't be saying it out loud and it's gonna mess up the whole perspective of the sentence. It says, write sentence 13 correctly on the lines below. You may write in cursive or print because we're trying to emphasize that. Well, it's got the word it used incorrectly. So I'll show it to you briefly in sentence 13. And this is in almost every test in all writing grades, either as a distractor or a correct answer. Capital, all in all, comma, introductory phrase. It's ownership. Pretty obvious that golf carts are a safer and more relaxing way to master the skill of driving for those of us with little or no experience period okay so if your kids pay attention closely they will recognize that it is ownership when it should have been it is pretty obvious that the apostrophe of the contraction is missing so let me show you in your answer key i said next page and after I show it to you, I want to show you three different kinds of it's that your kids will be exposed to and how we have to give examples and extensions of them. One is it is. One of them is it's something you own. The dog had its bone stolen from him. The dog owns that bone. Or it's it yes it could be it has it's been a long time so let's take a look at how the sentence 13 is written correctly in the um, answer key capital it's apostrophe s it is it is a it is pretty obvious that golf carts are a safer and more relaxing way to master the skill of driving for those of us with little to no experience, period. So that's the correct way to write that sentence. If you wanna save time, you just wanna check your kids understand the skill, then they can just write the word correctly and then just make them write a short sentence. It's hot in here. It's, it is hot in here with a capital on it's because you're using it as the first word of the sentence. So let me show you back here because I think it's important to sometimes say, well, I did read it, I underlined and I labeled, but there's nothing to eliminate because there's no multiple choice. Well, let's think of E in this case as executing strategies, giving examples of what you mean and doing an extension. So what I did was I went ahead and used all three of these it's in one sentence, hopefully correctly. Capital. It's been, hmm, that is, it, it has been very difficult for student. So what does that sound like when I, when I rough it up? Oh, I'm talking about more than one student. It, 
it has been very difficult for students to differentiate between these three words semicolon second mistake because we're adding to the information that we already have you can tell your kids yes you capitalize the pronoun i but not when it's among other letters you're continuing another independent clause so you can use a semicolon or you could put a period and a capital it's probably let me try it it's it is probably because they don't my third mistake you say oh what does don't mean it's probably because they don't do not realize the value of kinesthetic movement and its ownership ability to help with learning now because i did not stop the sentence then you would have the student holding his bouncy ball waiting for you to say period which will never come so we'd never bounce the ball or we would have our slinky and it would look something like this it's been very difficult for students to differentiate between these three words it's probably because they don't realize the value of kinesthetic movement and its way to help with learning period now if i would have actually spread my slinky one inch for each word i would have probably been a lot longer because that looks like over 20 words in those two combined sentences so there you have it, everybody that this is part two of modeling the editing of passages and essays in elar and writing using cups with two p's and two s's uh, you'll get those of you that registered for the live version or recorded version of the webinar you'll get part three which is the rest of passage two in my next video to you and if you teach high school or middle school students who are on a pretty high level i'm going to send another video just email me that you teach high level uh, seventh or eighth graders or high school students because I'm going to throw in one more editing passage that's at extremely high level. But several of these questions were pretty high level. And when you see my next video, it's also high. The second passage was medium level and difficulty. The third passage that you'll get next um, with a video is very rigorous. If you are watching this and you did not purchase the live webinar, you don't have to see it live. Everything that I did for those almost four hours is recorded digitally. So when you buy that, you'll actually get the PDF that everyone else got, the latest version of my binder. You'll get um, the PDF version of the handouts in both read format, where you can look at it on your computer with your students, or you can get it in print format, where you can actually print it out and then show it on your document camera like I did today. So God bless you guys. I hope that this was helpful. Please message me in the ELAR Writing Club if you have any questions. Email me there at the, let me see if I can get my hand in the right spot. Email me at writing underscore doctor at yahoo.com if you have any questions or you would like trainings at your campus or with your district. The website that has all the webinars to sign up for is right there. And you can buy lots of my stuff on teachers, pay teachers under my worldwide name, The Right Prescription. And the Facebook that you're viewing right now is my group called May the Force Be With You. It's my ELAR reading slash writing group. So share this video 
if you found it helpful. Because if you teach reading, these are some of the concepts that you're going to have to help your students master for reading fifth grade or higher. And I'm sure that fourth graders are also going to be able to have to start learning run ons and fragments or staffs and fast. So, on the writing test, you'll for sure get them this coming year. And you will probably, as a fourth grade teacher, see some of them in your students' field test items. There's going to be six editing or six revising uh, questions that are going to be thrown in there. Uh, or they might also get an extra paired passage uh, on the real test next year. You're going to get all of that stuff. So uh, they're basically going to expand so that ELAR, writing, and reading are all thrown together. Appreciate you guys watching for this long. God bless. Have a great day. Uh, enjoy yourself. Count your blessings. And love on your families. Appreciate your friends. May the force be with you and also with me.